Welcome to Harmonium LA, the podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Heady Gandolfi, emotional wellness expert, founder of Harmonium LA, and published author. The world needs healing now more than ever. My goal is to bring you inspiring conversations, tips, and techniques that will help you build a sustainable healing toolkit. The Harmonium LA podcast is the only resource you will need to slow down, stop searching, and start healing. Welcome back to another episode of Stop Searching and Start Healing. So today's guest is honestly one of the most genuine, sincere, and humble human beings that I have ever had the pleasure to meet. Um, he has an amazing gift of just making people feel really comfortable, really at ease, and just absolutely no judgment whatsoever. He's just truly, honestly, just fabulous. So I can't wait for you to, to join us and hear the conversation today because I know it's going to be so incredibly inspiring. So let me just talk to you a little bit about his bio and then we'll bring him into the show and let him do the talking. Robert Mack is an Ivy League educated positive psychology expert, celebrity happiness coach, executive coach, published author, and TV host producer. Robert studied under the direction of Martin Seligman, the founder of positive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. UPenn is the only institution in the world to offer a master's degree in applied positive psychology. The MAP degree is a degree held by only a few dozen people in the world. Robert is one of the world's leading experts on the relationship between happiness and success. He helps individuals and organizations achieve an energizing balance of authentic personal happiness and effortless professional success based on time-tested, face-valid, empirical data and timeless transcendental wisdom. Robert's work has been endorsed by Oprah, Vanessa Williams and many others. And he has been seen on Good Morning America, The Today Show, Access Hollywood, E, Own, GQ, Self, Health, Cosmopolitan, and Glamour. So without any further ado, please welcome Robert to the show. Okay, Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute honor to have you here. It really is. So thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You know, I love talking to you. So. Oh, it's amazing. And you know, it's so funny because I can't believe it's literally just over a year ago now, actually, that I was on your show, um, which I was so grateful for. So to have you now here talking about your stuff and, and how amazing you are as a human and with the work that you're doing is just such an honor. So thank you. Really, you know, it's amazing what a difference. My it pleasure. Is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The tables are turned. hundred percent. And we had no idea literally a year ago what that whole year was going to look like. I mean, we were just cracking forward with everything and then it all, all turned upside down. So anyways, but it's, um, so just, just a little bit of a backstory. I mean, we met originally almost four years ago now. I mean, I can't believe that either, how quickly time flies. Um, and I remember we met, it was um, a mutual friend of ours, Chris Harder, it was his 40th birthday. And uh, you know, I remember walking into the party, I didn't really know anybody. And I saw you were standing at the bar chatting with somebody and you know, we just, we connected. We connected initially over fashion. I mean, you looked fabulous as you always do. You had your like jacket on and your little pocket scarf it looked completely dapper. And um, I remember we chatted and we talked about fashion. We talked about Miami, we talked about, human connection and just people and just being. And it was just so easy. I mean, it was a really great evening. And I had no idea at the time who you were and who I was talking to. You were just this fabulous human. And, um, and I just would like to share this because I think it's kind of important. I don't I've never told you, I don't think, but um, a couple of days after that, I was um, in my car, I was driving to SoulCycle. And I remember I was listening to a podcast. I was actually listening to Laurie, Chris's wife, her podcast, and you were a guest on the show. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is Rob. I met him like literally a couple of days ago at the party. And so I was listening to this episode and I was absolutely blown away. I stopped my car outside Soul Cycle. I'm like, you know, I'm going to have to miss my class. I'm going to be late. I didn't want to stop listening to this episode because it resonated on so many levels. And I had no idea. I was like, wow, I can't believe like we had been talking at the party. I had no idea of your story and your history and where you would come from and where you were going. And it was just so powerful. I remember sitting in my car and I was literally crying my eyes. Out. I was literally such an emotional wreck because there was so much resonance to your story and I was very much at the beginning of my healing journey this is like four years ago so I was very much in the beginning stages of, of healing and so to listen to 
what you had been through and what you had come through and come out the other side was just so powerful for me. And I remember hearing you talk about your book. So I went out the next day and I bought your book and, um, and I even sent a couple of copies to some friends of mine back in the UK. And I just, I couldn't stop. I mean, I couldn't put this down. I mean, it's got the pages are turned, there's writing all over it because everything in this book is it's gold. It truly, truly is. And I think back then when I was reading it, a lot of it made sense, but I didn't fully understand it because I was still so new and I wasn't evolved enough to really appreciate a lot of what you were saying. But when I've read through it again since then, every single time there is just more and more gold. The, the nuggets are just bigger and more powerful every single time. And so I just first of all want to thank you for sharing this book with the world to, to bring this book to fruition because it's incredible. And also for just being so authentic and open with sharing your story from how you got from where you were to where you are now, the celebrity life coach doing incredible things with all this positive psychology. So I just wanted to share that. And I would just- I'm gonna to have to come on this podcast more often. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, my goodness, that was so incredibly eloquent and kind and generous. And it's just really a testament to your character because I felt the exact same way when we connected. I mean, mm -hmm. we had the most incredibly deep and profound and touching conversation. And mm -hmm. ever since then, the conversations just continued and I feel inspired and uplifted every single time we connect. And I'm so mm -hmm. grateful to you for that. So thank you so much for everything you said there oh, and shared truth. there. Mm -hmm. um, I received that fully, which I've had to work on in my life. And I just want to reflect mm -hmm. that back to you. So thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you, sweetheart. But um, what about like, so for people that don't know you and haven't heard your story, do you want to just start a little bit? Because I think the inspiration is just palpable when you share. So if you're good to share that. Would be yeah, amazing. for sure. I was, um, you know, I'm, I'm the least likely person probably in the world to be a happiness coach. <laughs> <because> <laughs> I was so unhappy as a child. I remember you know, at six or seven being deeply depressed and, you know, it was beyond dysphoric and I was super stressed out and anxious and self-loathing. I hated myself as much as I hated anything else in the world. Okay? I hated myself. And I always thought I would just grow out of it. You know, I thought I would, you know, perform pretty well academically and athletically and socially. And maybe I'd have a girlfriend one day. And, you know, I thought that all those things would fix it. And that didn't quite happen. As I got older, I just became more and more depressed got to a place where I was deeply and seriously suicidal. I used to think about committing suicide, I mean, dozens and dozens of times a day. It was probably mm -hmm. the one consistent theme in my life. Eventually got to a place where I did some research and decided I was gonna slit my wrist. And I went to a, the kitchen and got a kitchen knife and I rammed it into my wrist. And uh, oddly enough, something very strange happened when I, had this sort of suicidal moment. And that is, you know, for no good reason and without anything in my external circumstances changing at all, I mean, overall, I had a great life. I had a great loving family. I did well academically, I did well socially, athletically. Um, but despite nothing changing on the outside, something changed on the inside in that moment. I just felt this peace and this love and this joy that I'd never felt before in my entire life. And it was so palpable and it was so incredibly moving that I decided to postpone the suicide. I was like, oh, I'll put it off for just a couple minutes. I think at the time it was like an hour, which is ridiculous. I mean, to think an hour. Um, and at that time, the hour felt really long. I thought, oh, there's no right. way I'm doing the entire hour. So in that period, I started doing some research about suicide, about depression, about happiness. And I discovered some things that were pretty profound and very helpful. And uh, mm -hmm. look back now, 20 years later, and my life is very different than it was then. Oh, amazing. I mean, but the hour saved your life. Just being able to sow something inside of you was enough to say, hold on a minute. There's got to be a better way. There has to be a better way, right? You can't, this is not what, this is not how the story ends, right? Because like you say, you had everything on the outside, you know, Ivy League, you know, professional, you know, the sports that you were playing at the level that you were playing at and, you know, the career that you have, but where do you think that self-loathing stemmed from? Do you even know? Has that even... You know, I, it's a good question. It's a profound question. I, I think I was, you know, I, we do know that scientifically, some of us are wired to be a little bit more pessimistic. We're wired mm -hmm. a little low for happiness, right? So 50% of our 
happiness really can be attributed to sort of genetic wiring or DNA. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not malleable though. Clearly it's plastic. It's something that is changeable. And, you know, by surrounding yourself with the right people and sort of engaging in happy or happiness producing activities, and we'll talk mm. about some of that stuff, you can actually sort of raise the happiness set point that you're born with. And so mm. I feel like I was wired low for happiness. I was wired for unhappiness. I was wired for pessimism. And then over time, you know, I was also a perfectionist, you know, and I wanted right. to be perfect. And I was an overachiever. I was an overthinker, I think more than anything else. Mm. It was my overthinking that led me down this deep, dark, depressing hole that- So you probably just lived so much in your head. And when you're in that headspace, it's a whole different way of being and living, isn't it? Totally. I mean, because the brain, you know, the brain is really um, designed in such a way that it's meant to keep you alive, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of what keeps you alive doesn't always seem to make you happy, right? You know, most of the brain is, it's a, it's a problem solving instrument, right? A fantastic, mm -hmm phenomenal problem solving instrument, but it's also equally, if not even more so a troublemaker. Right, right, absolutely. But so, I mean, so to, to go back to that story, you know, you had got to this place and enough was enough and you, you had that moment of slowing down and thinking it through and not going through. And then, and then how, did, how did you then move forward? Because how did your life change? Because what were you, at that point you were working, where were you working? What was your life like on the outside at that point? Yeah, so I was working for a management consulting company, which, you know, even at the time I couldn't have described exactly what I did. I just basically did a whole lot of PowerPoint <laughs> slides. <laughs> you know? um, I was doing that. I had a beautiful girlfriend. She spoke five languages. She could play, you know, music by ear. She was beautiful mm -hmm. and brilliant and all that. And we all, of course, had a very unhappy kind of experience there at the end. Um, I was living in Philadelphia. Um, you know, my family was healthy. I had, you know, one German car on, on my way to getting a second German car that I did not need, um, but mm -hmm. I loved. And, uh, you know, I was doing pretty well. I was spending more money than I probably should have at the time, but I didn't realize it. I was trying to fill up that void on the inside. So my mm -hmm. life externally was pretty good. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of complaints. I loved the people I worked with, although I hated the job. So I will right. say that too. You know, I was living a life that was, um, to a large extent, very much out of alignment with mm. who I am. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, to the outside world, you had this incredible lifestyle. You had everything, ticking all the boxes. There was nothing that you needed and wanted, but inside there was this huge hole that you were trying to fill from the outside. That, that's right. And as life got better, I felt worse for it, which was odd to me, very strange to me. How could life get better and yet I feel worse for it? How could life get better right. objectively and subjectively I could be more depressed or more unhappy. Oh, I relate to that on so many levels. I mean, I, you know, just f from my perspective, I left school, left, left high school with a huge amount of self-loathing and self-hatred because I was bullied. So I know that that's where mine stemmed from. Um, but then I carried that with me because, you know, you, you think even running away or creating or collecting all these incredible things, you know, from the outside, having this amazing life, traveling the world and having all of the things, but inside literally dying. And to the point at one point where I, contemplated is this you know this needs to end it's it's this isn't working for me what else do I have but thank goodness I had my children so my turning point was hold on a second they need me I need them this is this is not how my story ends and that was the first way of me saying you know I have to change this this has to change um that's profound that and it resonates with me too because my mom shared an experience um that she had when she lost her parents and she sort of stuck around because she had us, she had kids, you know, and uh, it's interesting how that works. I sometimes um, half joke that I don't really trust anyone unless they've been through a serious bout of depression or suicidal ideation or stress and anxiety, because in some ways, all of that is frustrating as challenging as it is. It's a testament to how hard life can often feel, oh, right? Yes. It's like, yeah. you know, it is proof that you're sensitive enough and intelligent enough to recognize mm. how challenging life actually is. Oh, yes. And that said, it really truly is. And it's interesting because I know, so you wrote this book in 2009. So it's quite a while ago now, but yet uh, so much of the information, I mean, you talk in here at that time about the statistics, right, of suicide and depression and about how it was at an all time high and the average age had gone from 29 to 14 and a half. Yeah. So the Which first bout of depression. So shocking. That's right. 
the um, average age for the first bout of depression in like 1950 was like 29 years of age, mm -hmm. right? So 29 year olds really facing their first bout of depression. You know, fast forward 50 years later or so, you had 14 year olds or 13 year olds mm -hmm. who were contemplating suicide, who were deeply depressed, maybe even committing suicide mm -hmm. as you know, that was the average age for the first bout of serious depression. So, you know, we call that the progress paradox. Despite things mm -hmm. getting better in the world, and technological advances, longevity, all these health, you know, improvements, folks were actually not feeling happier for it. Yeah. And I can't even imagine now, fast forward another 10, 12 years since you wrote the book with COVID and everything that happened over the last year, what those statistics are right now. I mean, I dread to think quite harrowing they yeah. must be. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've, we've got, you know, um, still and relative to 19, we've got 10 times the level of um, access one and access two disorders, way more, um, you know, dr drug use and particularly opioids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got folks that, um, you know, a lot more deaths of despair, particularly we see that mm -hmm. with, you know, COVID stuff, you know, that's abuse, that's, um, you know, whether drug abuse or other forms of addiction, alcohol abuse, it could be domestic mm -hmm. violence. Um, yeah. in, in all ways, it's really an inability to regulate emotion. Absolutely. And one of the things you say in the book, you know, emotions are the ultimate currency. You know, and we don't necessarily know how to spend that currency or how to regulate those emotions, especially when we're in such a dark place. So where, where would, I mean, we could sit all day and I could literally talk from the beginning to end of this book because there's so much gold, as I said before. But from this, I mean, you talk about a couple of things. I mean, you know, the two myths of happiness and how can we kind of translate and help people that are dealing with this dark situation right now, especially more than ever. I mean, how can, how do we start with that? Yeah, so, you know, I think sometimes just looking into your own life and seeing the ways in which you've fallen victim to myths and misconceptions about mm -hmm. happiness, right? So that's the first piece. I mean, um, the second piece is, you know, so, so the first piece is stop looking for happiness where it doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. So you can never quite get enough of what you don't really need. So just mm -hmm. notice how, despite maybe making more money and having all these prayers answered and manifesting all of this stuff, and even manifesting all these relationships, how ultimately at the end of the day, you're probably in lots of cases, no happier than you right. were before all your mm -hmm. prayers were answered or you had manifested all this stuff. So that's the first piece. Stop looking for happiness where it doesn't exist, which is outside of you and in the future and start mm -hmm. looking for happiness in the only place that it lives in and exists, which is inside you here and now. And it can sound like such a cliche, but cliches mm -hmm. to go for a reason, right? So those are really the two steps and we'll dive deeper into that. But if you're mm -hmm. looking for happiness where it doesn't exist or live, you'll never find it. But Rob, if someone's to say, you know, listening to this and they're like, oh, it's easy for you to say, but I, you know, I've lost my job. I don't have any finance coming in now. You know, I've lost somebody so close to me through COVID or, you know, I don't know where it's easy for you to sit there and say, just look inside. How do you even begin to tackle that? Notice that there are moments during the day when you don't feel unhappy or depressed, despite mm -hmm. not having so many of the things that you want and deserve and maybe even need. I mean, eight hours every single night, maybe more, maybe a little less, you fall asleep and you mm -hmm. enter into a dreamless state where it's deep sleep and there's no dream. And notice how exquisitely peaceful and happy mm -hmm. you feel in that state, right? Or notice when during the day you're a little distracted, you see a beautiful little baby or you see a beautiful man or a woman or you see a beautiful sunset or you're lost by, you know, an incredible song or take a piece of chocolate. Notice how in that moment, everything else becomes completely irrelevant and you're lost in this experience of true joy or even just pleasure, right? right. And so nothing externally has really changed for you. It's just that your focus has changed. And because mm -hmm. your focus has changed, your experience of life has changed in that moment. And so you want to do what you can to sort of cultivate more and more moments like that. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that is just simply about presence, right? When you're truly tapped in, tuned in, turned on and focused on that, which you can control. But even yeah. more than that, focused on the peaceful aliveness that exists inside of you in every moment. It's mm -hmm. amazing not only how you improve the subjective quality of your life here and now, but how you also improve the objective circumstances and conditions of your life here moving forward out into the future right so how you feel yeah. now it dictates not just how you feel now but also how you do later mm. 
just being present and still that moment of calm and still and it's funny because you say in the book you know get high off your own supply is one of the things that you say and and I love your you know your take on that because so many people are looking like you said earlier outside and will turn to other methods of coping and numbing and getting high drink drugs sex gambling whatever it might be but actually talk to us about that getting high yeah. off your own supply. so you know I worked uh as a like model and actor for like 10 years when I was trying to put mm. myself in you know graduate school and I couldn't find any jobs and let me tell you, I was voted most shy of my high school class. So I was the last person to also do that. Like, had I not been <laughs> pushed into it by this random, you know, agent who happened to be walking on the streets who said, hey, you should check out the smalling agency. I would have never have done that, you know, just fell mm. into it. And I met a photographer once and he shot for like Tory Secret and all these places. And he said, you know, every great photograph makes a promise that it cannot keep. And that always stuck with me. And I never quite understood that. But as I started living my life, I noticed that everything and everybody in your life sort of unintentionally makes a promise that it cannot keep. And that promise is, I will make you happy. It all says the same thing, you know, like the money says that, the relationships say that, even health says that, right? I will make you happy. But at some point in your life, you begin to see through that because you start to experience hopefully lots of it and you realize that none of it makes you happy. And mm -hmm. so instead of trying to get happy off of, you know, anything outside of you in the future, you really do want to try and get high off your own supply, meaning get high or, or happy off of your own existence, off your own presence, off the way in which you think about your life and the way in which you live your life, right? And so it's something that you're ultimately in control of, not the world mm. and not anybody else. Yes, taking, taking ownership and taking control of your own life. And another thing that you say is um, there's nothing fashionable about being miserable which I love because we met and connected over fashion and that's the world that you were in. Um, but it's so true. It's not, I mean, there's nothing else, you know, misery loves misery and all of that kind of thing. But yeah, you have to come from that place of, of fully being content within you, slowing down, going within and knowing that there is a science behind it. Absolutely. Right. That's the fascinating thing. There's an entire field of psychology. It's about 20 some years old, you know, sort of founded by Mark Barney Seligman, who was really, Sort of, he's like he's sort of the godfather, the grandfather of positive psychology. But before studying positive psychology, he studied learned helplessness and depression, mm -hmm. and you know essentially what leads to unhappiness. But he found that if you remove the dysfunction from people, if you remove what's wrong from people's lives, you don't get a thriving individual. You get a flatlining individual. And so he talked mm -hmm. about we need to also focus on the positive in people and what's going well with people and the strength in people. That's really how you get a happy, healthy, wealthy, thriving individual or family or organization or world, right? And so this entire field of positive psychology really you know, sprang out of his work at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's all about focusing on what makes life worth living. And it's incredible some of the findings that have unfolded over the last 20 years or so. And it's, this is amazing because you're one of the few humans in the world that hold this degree, right, from, from your pen yeah. that you took with him. So, I mean, that's phenomenal in itself. And how, at what point were you, did you start to realize that that's something that you wanted to focus on? So you'd gone through all of, you know, this depression and then you'd gone through, I remember you said that you sold everything. So you had your two German cars, you had the apartment, you had the girlfriend, you had all of these things and you literally sold it all. And you bought a scooter. I think yeah. you still have that scooter to this day, don't you? I remember seeing you driving around LA on it. <laughs> um, and you just- the same basic realized, idea. Yeah. Right, and you moved, didn't you move from New York to Miami and you just sold everything? And then talk to us about exactly. that. Exactly, I was in the Northeast, I was in Philadelphia. I moved to Miami. You know, there was a point in my life when I was so depressed and suicidal that I was like, I really don't know much about life. I might think that I know a lot about life, but it's all of, my achieving and accomplishing and acquiring is leading me to want to kill myself. I have to admit, I don't know much, right? So then <laughs> I thought, maybe if nothing else, I'll just try to do the opposite of what I'm doing. You know, I think I had seen an episode mm -hmm. of Seinfeld and there was like opposite day or whatever, opposite light. And you know, <laughs> George basically started making the opposite decision. So I said, I'm going to start doing the opposite of what I'm doing. I live in a cold, rainy place that I don't particularly love. I'm going to move to Miami. I have a job that makes good money. I'm not going to to, you know, do this job very much longer. I'll, I'll do find something else. Uh, this relationship is incredible, or the woman I was dating was incredible, but it's not really making me happen. Be single for a while, and so I made all these decisions, kind of in a fell, you know, one fell swoop. And 
it began to actually have an effect on me. I felt like, you know, a little alive. And part of that was selling, the, reading the two German cars and getting a scooter. And I cannot tell you how free I felt just by being relieved of the burden, the financial burden is a concern, but also this rat race and hedonic treadmill that I had been on for so long. Mm. And do you think that right there is the difference when you talk about the difference between synthetic happiness and authentic happiness? That's a pretty good example right there, right? Absolutely. You know, we try to synthesize or manufacture this happiness. You know, it's like eating junk food all day, every day. Mm. It may kind of appeal to your eye and it might, you know, seem so interesting and fun and exciting. But when you notice how you feel as you're mm. eating it, particularly afterwards, you notice that you just feel sick and you end up getting, you know, less and less healthy as a result of it. So absolutely authentic happiness comes from within, mm. you know, authentic inauthentic happiness or synthetic happiness is something that you try to manufacture from without. Love that. Beautiful. So talk to us about these eight principles that you have, because in the book, you talk about eight principles of happiness and they're amazing. I mean, they're so profound and yet so simple. I think that's the key too. So can you share some of that with us? I'm going to Venmo you and Zell you. I like <laughs> say that, but I mean that like it's really kind of you to say. So I would say, so the first really for me, the, what I wanted to call it, we called it something a little different, but it was like the path of least resistance, but I wouldn't really want to mm. call it what it really is, is lazy intelligence, right? So the one thing that, I mean, I, I appreciate my parents for so many things, but one of the things I appreciate them for was teaching me the value of hard work and discipline, you know? I and I also got to a place in my life where my dad sat me down and said, all right, son, you've done well in terms of the hard work and now it's time to focus on working smart, you know? And so a huge part of happiness is really trying to get equal or better results with respect to happiness with less time, energy, and effort. Right? So mm -hmm. you want to take the laziest but smartest path to happiness, the direct path. You know, the long scenic path is fine, but that essentially means stop routing your happiness through mm -hmm. other people and other things. You know, and instead of going through middle men and middle women and middle things, go directly to the source for it, right? And so one key tip and trick there is just to identify the activities and the people that with very little let time, energy, or effort allow you to feel inspired, energized, uplifted, and just happy to be alive. And you want to do everything you possibly can to spend more time doing those activities or spending time with those people. Yep. Yeah. And that and being in that happiness, you talk about like a, a happiness state of being, happiness state of mind. And you can't achieve that if you're not surrounding yourself with thoughts and people and feelings that are in that same vibration. You just nailed it. And you really do need to do just that. Ideally, you're going to need to surround yourself and drown yourself mm. in happy circumstances, conditions, or just happy activities and people, most importantly. And even if they're not happy people, at least people aspire to be happy. It's interesting how yeah. most of us think so long and hard about what we're going to eat and we think so long and hard about what career we're gonna take and maybe mm. even where we're gonna live or what we're gonna wear, but we very rarely take the time to think about what our life is ultimately for. Like, what are you optimizing your life for? Why do you get up mm -hmm. every single day, right. go to that job, work out, whatever it is that you do, why do you do that? Mm. You really just do it because you think you'll feel better for having done it. Even when you give money or you give blood, ultimately yeah. you do it because you think you're going to feel better as a result of it. And so mm. we can take a much lazier, smarter, more direct path to happiness instead of routing it through so many other middle things. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting because there's a very similar correlation between the work that I do and the work that you do, because, you know, with harmonium, it is about bringing you into this very deep state of relaxation. So you're half awake and half asleep. So you're working with really stimulating the nervous system and activating that parasympathetic side of the nervous system, which allows you to drop into this space where it's just you and you. And so that your body can then start to figure out what it needs to do. And I say, it's a harmonium state of mind that people get themselves into. That's so good, so powerful. And even as you describe it, I can feel myself drop into that place, you know, and, um, <laughs> There's a, one of my favorite quotes, uh, it's an Abraham Hicks quote, but mm. essentially say, you know, when you find harmony with yourself, you find harmony with everybody and everything else in the world, even if they don't find harmony with you. And I think mm. that's critical. I think that's 
a key component to both of what of the kind of work that we do. It's finding harmony yes. within, not seeking that harmony without. But when you find it within, you find it without too. And it happens in an easy, effortless, and enjoyable way. Mm. Yes. And that makes me think of the story. And I and I said this to you the other day, you know, when you talk about the Wizard of Oz, right? And you relate that to overcoming adversity and how adversity can, I mean, share that with us. Cause I love that in the book when you talk about the Wizard of Oz, cause we all know that movie, we all love it. We've seen it a million times. Yeah. But I love so, how you pull from that. Yeah, so if you, I, I love that you re um, referenced that because, you know, I'd watched Wizard of Oz so many times and the whole point of Wizard of Oz is that Dorothy goes on this incredible journey looking and searching for, you know, and meeting all these people along the ways. And it's interesting, it's fun, it's super scary at times. And yep. she does all that only to come back to realize that everything she was really looking for was in her own backyard. It was there mm. all along, right? And so that's really the journey of life to some extent. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go on the journey, enjoy the journey, absolutely. And right, meet incredible right. people and all that stuff. But it will be so much more of an enjoyable journey if you can remember that you take yourself meaning you take the kingdom of heaven, you take happiness with you wherever you go. That also means that you take unhappiness with you and hell with you wherever you go. And so yes. that's really the re uh, realization and recognition is that you know heaven and hell isn't just something that you enter into one day in the future. Heaven and hell is something that you carry with you here and now. Mm. Wow. Yes, it really is. And using both of those sides of the coin to propel you forward rather than pull you back and appreciate that every person, situation, experience is helping to push you forward should you choose that mindset. You just nailed it. And that's where scriptures like, you know, um, everything works together for good for those who love God or those who love good or those who love mm -hmm. happiness. Use any word you want. It's a synonym. But like, that's exactly right. It's fascinating how thoughts of death, for instance, when I was 14 years old or 17 years old or 22 years old were the bane of my existence. It was a hell, a hellish experience. And now I look back a couple of years older now and just those a couple. thoughts, just a couple, just a couple, <laughs> those thoughts actually bring me such joy, right? I feel such relief about that. Like, oh my goodness, like thinking about death enhances the value and the worth of my life now. And also I've kind of come to realize that thinking about death in the ways that I have has helped me to discover and realize something that's perfectly deathless inside. Mm. Right? And, and so there's no, there's no fear around that anymore, right? So it's interesting how depending on your eyes, depending on your vision, the exact same thoughts or people or activities or experiences or circumstance conditions in one time of your life can be absolutely depressing and lead you to yeah. suicide. And at another point in your life, they can actually be inspiring and uplifting and energizing and lead you to feelings of happiness. Mm. And to see how far you've come. How, and you know, you have to always hit rock bottom before you can start to pick yourself up and come through the other side. And it's okay. And it's and, and to be able then to share that experience to help others, which is what you have done with the book and continue to do with your speaking and all of the things that you do is so powerful and necessary. You just crushed it and you nailed it. I mean, you can't have a rags to riches story without having had rags at some point, right? Mm. I mean, we're all inspired by like these stories of people overcoming the most tremendous adversity, the most yeah. incredible trials and tribulations and tragedy and to go on to triumph. We love those stories. We pay money to go to a movie theater or not these days to rent the movie. We pay money to read books and so, to listen to podcasts about it. We pay money to hear that, just to hear it. And so it's hard when you're in the thick of it and you're in the throes of something that's extraordinarily traumatizing or frustrating or upsetting. It's hmm. hard to remember that this is all part of your story, that this mess will eventually one day become, you know, your message or your, or, you know, provide you with real meaning and impact. But that's precisely the story. Like my greatest and my greatest problems have led to my greatest purpose. My greatest problem was depression and suicide. It's led me to yes. a career that's all about helping people out of that experience. Mm -hmm. So you just absolutely nailed it. I mean, that's the whole point is that our highest purpose always or often comes from our deepest problems.
And that just is that beautiful, rich tapestry of life, just interwoven with pain and joy and purpose and understanding and being able to relate to other people um, and then to inspire and to lead other people through that because you have been there and you've experienced and witnessed and ultimately overcome all of that. And I'm sure, and I have no doubt in, in my mind, because I know for me it is, but for you too, it's still constant and it's still ongoing because there's always going to be another challenge or something else. So it's not like you've got this amazing degree in positive psychology. You've written this fantastic book that's such an incredible tool that every single person should have, by the way. Um, but you still have to do the work because there's always going to be something else that comes up. Absolutely. I mean, and you can read any spiritual teacher you know, I love, I'm an avid, voracious reader. I'm obsessed with books. I think the one thing I've always been clear about in my life is that I'm smart enough to know I'm not very smart. So I should reach out to smarter people. <laughs> you know, that's why I love talking to you. And, you know, and, and, and to that end, they'll all say the same thing, which is that, you know, uh, it's a practice. It's something that you have to continue mm -hmm. to invest energy in. I don't like to call it effort necessarily because I believe that it can be play. It should be joyful. I find it fun. Mm -hmm. I don't call it discipline. It's blissipline because I'm so committed to... Oh you know, making it fun or enjoying it, right? So, but yes, um, and the difference I think too is that, you know, sometimes I say, ha you know, all cases of unhappiness are cases of mistaken identity. The difference is not necessarily, I mean, your life does improve. When you become happier, we know scientifically, statistically, that when you become happier, you improve the objective conditions and circumstances of your life in very measurable and tangible ways. So happy people, live six to seven years longer, sometimes up to 11 years longer. They make more money, 600 to $700,000 on average over the course of their entire lifetime. Wow. They get married earlier, stay married longer, are happy in the relationships, whether they're married or not, because definitely it's not about marriage, right? It's about love and happiness. Mm -hmm. They can get better health outcomes, all those things. So happiness is not only the greatest success because it's why we want success, but it also leads to success in very measurable and tangible ways. And it does it through a lazy, intelligent approach. And do you think that's also a lot to do with the vibrational state that that brings that happiness and joy and bliss, discipline brings you to that higher vibrational state? Absolutely, I mean, it, you could feel it. I mean, walk mm. into a room, you can feel the energy and particularly if you're an empath, you're listening to this, you're probably an empath, but you walk into a room and you can feel if there's lots of stress there or anxiety there or if it's upliftment and, you can feel yeah. the energy. I can, you know, I have, I, when I was a kid, I was so sensitive to energy that I couldn't tell the difference between my own emotions and anybody else's. And that was a problem then. But now as a coach, the second I get on the phone, before the other person has said a word, I can already, I already feel, I know what they're feeling, you know, without even them speaking to it. And so mm -hmm. emotion is more contagious and infectious than anything else on the entire planet. And it's creative. Emotion is creative. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it's a vibrational equivalent that we quote unquote attract back. Um, it's one way of putting it. Um, but yeah, emotion, uh, it's emotion, it's an emotional journey uh, more mm. than a physical journey ultimately. Yeah, uh, so true. And I guess remembering, so for people that are listening when they feel like they're really challenged, it's just remembering that um, to just be able to, to remain present, but to do what you can with what you've got where you're at. I know you say that, and as I think Mike Dooley also says that I've heard a couple of times, but it's so true because it's like you say, don't worry about what has been and gone because you can't change that. Don't worry about what might happen next and down the road because you have no idea. You can only do what you have with what you've got right now. Oh, so good. This is why I love conversations with you. You're absolutely <laughs> right about that. You know, when you know better, you do better. Okay, mm. and um, there is there is there is no value, and you cannot find yourself in the past, and you will mm. not find yourself in the future. You know, you will only find yourself in the present, in presence itself. And yeah. lots of us feel and think that we need time to manifest what we want, or we need time to discover who we are. But we actually need the timelessness. We need timelessness to, and that's all about presence, right? And when you're in yes. deep presence. We'll call it flow state. When you're so mm -hmm. tapped in, tuned in, turned on, dialed in and consumed and absorbed and engaged with what you're doing, that you have no interest in evaluating or analyzing how you're doing, when you're just enjoying the moment that deeply, you find that that kind of presence takes care of the future, right? Mm -hmm. So if we take care of the present, the present takes care of the future. And that's not about time. That's about timelessness, right? So you lose a sense 
of self-consciousness. You lose a sense of time consciousness and things just seem to come to you, right? Everybody yes. knows that flow state. If you've played sports, if you've been in entertainment, if you've just lived your life, you know there have been specific periods of your life when you've been in flow state and things just seem to come so easily. And mm. so that's about not waiting on time, but sort of waiting on welcome. It's all about being in that timeless state of presence. Mm. Absolutely. And consciousness, conscious presence too, being aware of what is going on. Great point, because you, there's an argument here that, well, we always only live in the present. You know, the past is history and the future is really just imagination, right? So the past mm -hmm. is memory, the future is, you know, imagination. And we only really ever live in the present moment. There is, you can't put a finger on the future, no matter how much we talk about it, you can't yeah. put a finger on the past or the future. But are you aware of that? You know, do you mm -hmm. live in your mind, in your head, where you're always projecting in the future or projecting into the past? And so you're absolutely right about that. It's about conscious presence. Mm. And coming into your heart space, and I know you love to talk about that, like coming into that emotional center, that heart-centered space and out of the mind so that you can really feel and appreciate where you're at. Absolutely. I mean, I think the challenge and opportunity for all of us is to spend more time living from our heart. And mm -hmm. by that, I mean living from that place in space, which is really a placeless place and a spaceless place. We call it the heart, but it just sort of means the center of your being, yes. where you're no longer obsessively and compulsively thinking about everything or everybody or anybody or anything. Mm -hmm. And you're just feeling that peaceful aliveness that not only is within you, but that you ultimately are, right? When you come from that place of heart-centeredness, it's incredible, first of all, how much more peace you feel. And that's the first mm -hmm. sign that you're on the right path when you feel that peace. And then secondly, you start to know or notice how things just sort of work themselves out for you. You know, like the path yeah. ahead of you becomes perfected. It, you prepave this beautiful experience that's both joyful and successful. So yeah, living from the heart is just critical. And it's interesting because I think we forget, you know, the heart, isn't it the first organ to be formed in a fetus more before the brain. And yet people think the brain is the first organ to form, but it's actually the heart. Absolutely. It's so fascinating. Great point about that. And, you know, even with kids, you know, the prefrontal cortex, not only evolutionarily was, is it the last to develop, but also in kids, you know, you, kids don't really have the ability to think in abstract terms until they enter into their early teenage years and, and beyond. And so yeah. they come from a very heart-centered place. And that's why we often talk about things like childlike faith. You know, it's yes. not really about just belief. You can believe that gets you so far, but kids don't have a whole lot of spiritual religious ideas. They just mm -hmm. live deeply and fully in the present moment with total trust in life, right? Yes. I mean, it's incredible. So absolutely, um, you know, this heart thing is huge. And it's a, not about thinking your way there and figuring out everything all the time, because that's impossible. It's mm -hmm. more often about taking this emotional journey um, that's really about living and coming from the heart. Uh absolutely beautiful so so true and so poignant and so profound and just so simple and that's the beauty of it we overcomplicate things you, oh my gosh and i'm the poster boy for overcomplicating. <laughs> are you kidding that's how i'm in this position i am today i was in position 20 years ago overcomplicate everything and if you look into nature look into nature you know if you ever want a tip on how to live your life look into nature nature experiences the same problems trials tragedies, mishaps, accidents, losses, mm. illnesses, deaths that we experience as human beings, yeah. as people. But only people have made a problem of their own existence. Only people mm. have made you know, a problem of living. And all of nature is blissful except for human beings, right? I mean, they're just perfectly blissful. Mm. So take a tip from nature if you're ever in doubt. And mm. if you notice, nature is deeply, fully present, still, silent. Um, and just enjoying life. Hmm. So top tips right there, get back to nature and be childlike in your thinking and your way of being and yes. things will just magically start to shift. So, I mean, my tip to everybody listening is to actually get your book. And I know you're not paying me for this. It's just because I just believe and I know having read it and 
now living by it. It's just everybody needs to have this because there's so much gold, tiny chunks, huge chunks, you know, enormous nuggets in here that people can take and utilize. And they are practical. They're free. It doesn't cost anything. And so, you know, for me, everybody needs to have a copy of happiness from the inside out. But what would you say to, to everyone that's listening? What's kind of like your top tip as, you know, from your perspective that people can utilize today now, given everything that they've probably been through and is still going through because we still don't know where we're headed right now. Um, what's your top advice? Yeah, so at least four things, okay? So there are like four states really, or phases in your happiness journey. Mm. Like the first state is sort of like, you know, you're chasing things in the world, people in the world. And so you wanna sort of dial, you don't have to dial it back, but you certainly wanna pivot and mm. focus instead on doing things that make you happy. So start with happiness is what I do. Okay. And identify your happiness audience, things that you love doing, that you feel inspired doing, that you feel energized for having done. And try to do more of those things. In order to get there, you have to identify your happiness values. Those are things that you don't enjoy doing, you know, things that don't energize you, things that drain you. You want to try and to outsource or delegate or reduce or eliminate all of your happiness values. So that's step one is think about happiness as what you do. But then you graduate from that at some point. And you realize that even the happiest activities sometimes don't bring you happy, happiness. And even True. sometimes the least happy activities does bring you a sense of happiness. And so you graduate from this happiness is what you do to happiness is what I think, right? And then you start to think about happiness as a state of mind. And so then you're really wanting to focus on happiness, happy things, or unhappy things in a happy way. It is impossible to be happy if you're focusing on unhappy things consistently, right? So if you live in heaven and there's a pothole on Main Street and you focus all your attention and energy on the pothole, I promise you, it's not gonna feel like heaven, right? And yeah. so happiness is kind of what you think. The third sort of sta uh, stage, and these don't have always happen, you know, in the way I'm describing, sometimes they overlap and you do things in parallel, but the other part is happiness is who you spend time with, right? And so that's critical. So the first thing is identifying the happiness activities of your life and trying to do more of those. Second part is making sure that you're telling better feeling stories based in truth about your life and especially yourself, but about everything and doing it just to feel good. And then trusting mm -hmm. that it's going to lead to better circumstances and conditions as well. But this third piece is about doing everything you can to reduce, eliminate the time you spend with people who make you unhappy or make you feel stressed or anxious. Okay. That's critical. Um, and spend more time with people that make you feel uplifted and inspired and at peace and make mm -hmm. you feel loved, right? So that's the third. And then the fourth is what I would really call the master key, the ultimate key. It's really the cheat code. And I, because I'm impatient, like to jump here, but most folks will find it difficult to just make the quantum leap directly to this. But ultimately, happiness is presence. And presence is not thinking, okay? It's being able to be in the presence of someone and hear them particularly with your heart, but not be in your head the entire time, not just waiting to talk, but really being there, mind, body, and soul, mind, body, and spirit. It's being able to, you know, enjoy your day, Swiffer, fold clothes, without being lost in discursive thinking, right? But instead to rest in and as God, to rest mm -hmm. in and as the true self, which is thoughtless, wordless, infinite, eternal. That faceless, formless presence and awareness that you are is happiness already. It's already <laughs> happiness. It's that feeling of that blanket, that sort of blind, naked awareness of your own presence and existence, like that I am, like just the recognition that you're alive before there's any thoughts to complicate it. That's already happiness. But most of us skip right over that and we put so much time, energy, and attention mm -hmm. in thoughts and sensations and perceptions and, and all that that we just lose the sun. It's always shining from behind the clouds, right? We're so obsessed with the clouds, yeah. we forget about the sun. So that sun exists within you. We call it the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind because it means mm -hmm. the thoughtless, wordless mind. But that yeah. eternal sunshine, that invincible summer exists within you as you all the time. You just want to put more time or more focus and attention on it. Uh. That, I mean, I feel my heart smiling and just feeling like it's just listening to that and taking that in. It's powerful. So take inventory. 
take start just to sit in your own space, take inventory of your thoughts, you know, your feelings, remove all of those things and what makes you happy, who makes you happy and really start to become conscious and aware of making those choices. It's all about choices. We choose, right? Absolutely. You, you do choose. And, 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 and I know I used to have a trouble with that. I'd say, well, I'm not choosing mm-hmm. to be unhappy. Who would choose to be unhappy kind of thing, but yeah. you, and it doesn't often look like a choice because we all come with a lot of programming, a lot of conditioning, yeah. and our brain gets wired to do mm-hmm. this unhappy thinking thing or this unhappy activities thing. We get kind of addicted to this unhappiness in a way because sometimes we get sympathy for being unhappy. It's like being unhealthy yeah. sometimes, you know, and it's understandable. But I promise if you can just break this down into really bite sized pieces, just do it one thought at a time, one moment at a time. You don't have to do it for mm-hmm. all of eternity, for all of the future. You don't have to heal everything in the past. Sure, do that kind of work, but just notice what thought am I having now? Can I choose a thought that feels better, but still true? Can I just mm-hmm. do that? Or if I was gonna spend time with this person who makes me unhappy, can I just say, well, maybe later, but not right now. Can I just start making mm-hmm. tiny little bite size digestible choices that feel easy, that I know will ramp up and build momentum that in 21 to 66 days, based on all the research, mm-hmm. will rewire my brain for a happier, healthier, wealthier experience of life. And how long, I mean, in the scheme of things, 21 to 66 days, it's nothing. In the scheme no. of things, nothing. It, it's nothing. I mean, look how many of those 21 to 66 days just passed in this year, right? Uh, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> six, six to 12 of them. So yeah, it's crazy. Mm. Uh Rob, I mean, literally we could talk on through so much, so much and just incredible, just so inspiring, so uplifting, so powerful, so authentic and just for being so raw and to just be so open and honest about your own story and challenges and to see where you were and how you are now is just incredible. So I'm beyond grateful for you taking time to come share all of this wisdom and knowledge with us. I so appreciate it, the pleasure and privilege. And I mean this from the deepest Mm. core of my heart. It's mm. all mine. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate not just you doing what you do and not just having the conversation with me, which is just priceless, but you mm. being who you are. I mean that from the very first day I met you, every single conversation we've ever connected with, you are always the ultimate and consummate kind spirit. And mm. you've done nothing but share of yourself um, generously and uh, consistently. So thank you so much for that. Oh. And, program i appreciate that yeah so we'll put all of your contact details all all the info where people can find you all the book information um i mean i mean you're everywhere anyways so um it's just wonderful a gift a pleasure and an absolute honor rob thank you so much thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for joining me today i truly hope that you enjoyed the show and there is at least one thing that you can take away from today's episode that will help you build that sustainable healing toolkit. It would mean the absolute world to me if you would subscribe to the show, give it a five-star review and share this or any of the other episodes with somebody that you feel could really benefit by listening. I look forward to seeing you next time.